This is the Free Hill Life Podcast, episode number 60. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Hill Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's another Monday, and it's a beautiful Monday, everybody. Stoked to be back. And I uh, hope you guys had a great weekend out there, all you weekend warriors that were making some turns, or if uh, you got away for a little vacation, hopefully that was the case. Either way, I hope you're telemark skiing somewhere around planet Earth. So hopping right into it, newsroom and notes. One thing we wanted to focus on from uh, the shop is Telemark ski packages. So we this year have a little bit better system on the website where we've pre-made some packages for skis, boots, and bindings. And you can also do a custom uh, ski boot and binding setup. Now, with that said, uh, ski inventory is starting to get lower. You know, we're getting past the first of the year and we've sold a lot of equipment. So (laughs) it's probably a good time to get off the fence. If you are thinking about getting a ski telemark ski package put together this year, this is a good time to do it. You can always reach out to one of our professionals at the shop Uh, directly via email, customer service at freeheellife.com or give us a ring during shop hours and we would be happy to kind of walk you through the process. And that's really our forte is, you've heard me talk about it, but we understand and our whole method is kind of based around the idea that if we understand the gear that you're coming from, it's much easier to get you on something that's gonna be enjoyable moving forward. And the only way you can do that is working with someone that actually telemarks and understands the equipment that one you were on and where you are going. So we don't want to just sell you the shiny new stuff for no reason. We want to make sure that you're getting something that's going to, you know, keep your telemark turn the way that it was meant to be, how you made it. And that way you can enjoy your precious time and money that you're spending on those expensive ski tickets or backcountry time, and uh, you know you're getting something that's good. So, ski packages. Think about them, reach out. Next item of business is one of my favorite days of the year, World Telemark Day. So I started World Telemark Day uh, many moons ago, and this is a day to celebrate the Telemark turn wherever you are at. It's always on the first Saturday in March. So this year it's going to be on March 6th. Uh, If you don't know what World Telemark Day is, you can listen to podcast episode number six and learn all about it, kind of the history, how I came up with the idea, what it really is, and uh, participate. So like I said, it, it can happen anywhere. It's a day about telemark skiing. So just plan on going out that day and celebrating the day. Um, I'll have some logos available for the 2021 event press release and uh, other little things that you can grab if you're trying to get a little local gathering together. And it's something that everybody can do. Uh, Also, I do have a Facebook group I set up specifically for that, but I'm probably going to create something within um, our main Free Hill Life Facebook group that we can kind of communicate on the topic. And if you're like a local person that kind of wants to organize a little gathering, and it's as simple as this, you say, hey, all telemark skiers at this mountain, we're gonna meet at you know, bottom of the lift, 9 a.m. and whoever wants to make some turns, we're gonna go do it and take a photo and uh, that's that's it. So it's a, it's a day to celebrate, doesn't really have a centralized event at this point. So on to other events going on, Uh, Midwest United States folks, listen up. This Saturday at Caberfay Peaks in Cadillac, Michigan, the Lower Peninsula Pinhead Reunion is happening. 9 a.m. start. If you're there, get there, hang out, send some photos. Those are some good people. And uh, we're sending our love and support. We sent some swag out to them for the event. And it's good to see a couple little gatherings happening safely in this COVID environment. So good to get outside, get some fresh air, and make some turns, make those quads burn. Uh, Other Midwest stuff in the works is February 12th through the 14th, 
We've got the annual Midwest Telefest at the Porcupine State Park in the UP, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Now, our new certified ski tech, Keith Opperman, who runs our service and demo fleet in the area, more specifically Washburn, Wisconsin, uh, will be there with the entire demo fleet. So don't miss out. This is a great chance for if you want to try Telemark. Those are free demos and you can take a friend and you can learn to telemark. It's really fun. I went to the Porkies last year and uh, we will uh, be there this year with Keith. And I think there are going to be some surprise guests there as well. So we're stoked. Uh, if you've been to Midwest Telefest, it is going to be a little bit different with the COVID uh, situation going on in terms of gatherings and whatnot. So it will be safe for all that participate. Again, great time to get some fresh air. It's right on the coast of Lake Superior and a wonderful time up there near Ontonagon. Awesome place to go. So today's episode, I'm going to go back to one of the most basic questions there is. What is telemark skiing? So if you're new to telemark skiing or not so new uh, to it, I'm really hoping this podcast will help clear up some of the history of the turn, where it came from, how it came to be, and uh, maybe a little bit about where it's going. Uh, Winston Churchill once said, the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. And I think this is a fantastic quote about uh, history in general, but, you know, even Telemark and uh, one that illustrates my philosophy on the importance of preserving and understanding the history of the turn uh, in order to understand more about how to proceed in the future. And I can tell you that, you know, running Freehill Life uh, and, you know, working in Telemark for the last 20 years, but having the shop especially, and we preserve a lot of the history. And I think you know, me just being around longer, it's fascinating to me how easily things are forgotten and you know it, it's it's like a like an old school game of telephone you know like it it, it can kind of you know like where someone starts with a message you know that they're given and then they tell the next person and they tell the next person you know sometimes by the by the time it gets to the end of the line it's a little bit skewed and maybe not so <laughs> so much what you started with so um so that was kind of my hope today is go back and answer the really basic question about what is Telemark and what is Telemark skiing specifically and where did it come from? What was it? What did it look like in the beginning? You know, um, and you know, what does it look like today and kind of how do those two things go together? Uh, so to begin the process, uh, it's important to go back to the beginning, get some points of reference on the topic and some facts kind of, uh, give us some perspective. So just a, a quick note, I'm going to be using some excerpts from, uh, Sondre Norheim.com. It's run by Anne Gry Bleakum and journalist Ivan Mold. And they also wrote a fantastic book. If you have not read it called Sondre Norheim which was released in 2003. And it wasn't super easy to get a hold of that book for a long time, but now with Amazon, I, I looked it up before I hopped on the podcast. You can get copies of it. It's a fantastic book. It's a great breakdown. It's kind of It was kind of a, uh, taken from the original sondrenorheim.com website and uh, has some really good facts and, and just good history in it. So... I pulled some stuff from that. I also pulled a few research items from a website called lifeinnorway.net. So just wanted to kind of uh, cite my cite some of the resources. And then obviously I'm just going to be kind of infusing some opinions into this and uh, some experience from having traveled a couple times to Telemark, Norway, uh, and to uh, some of those areas that we're going to be talking about. So kind of a good place to start is uh, the history of skiing in Norway itself. And within Scandinavia, the earliest known reference to skiing dates back to around 3000, 4000 BC. Uh, primitive carvings 
depict human figures walking on skis. One of the most well-known is the carving at Rodoy in Norway's Nordland. The skier is holding a single pole and he's using skis of a rather large length. Uh, it's, it's a pretty famous carving. You probably would recognize it if you saw it. Um, there's also a famous uh, Alta rock carvings depicting a hunter on skis. And that image dates to around 1000 BC. So we're talking a long time ago. Skiing's been around for a while. And, uh, you know, obviously in, in, you know, this is talking about um, history of skiing in Norway, specifically in Scandinavia. Um, there was obviously some other stuff going on uh, as well during that time. But it's it's been around a, an extremely long time. And, you know, in kind of, again, I'm sort of focusing on Norway specifically, but, you know, one thing to keep in, in mind is in a country with long distances between these small eight isolated communities, um, hard snowy winters, you know, skiing was a means of traveling, you know, how people kept in contact with each other, how people got goods and services to each other, you know, how they traveled, how they got around. And, you know, obviously, like I mentioned too, you know, some of, uh, some of those depictions from 1000 BC were talking about hunters. And so skis were also important for the hunter and the farmer, you know, going out into the forest, uh, to find food, you know, bring game home, um, grab firewood, you know, go from one dwelling to another. So the application of skis, you know, in this time, you know, it was very, uh, it was a tool, you know, it was a tool to use from getting A to B and, you know, make sure you're not post holing, um, <laughs> you know, up to your waist in deep snow. And so it was a necessity. So, you know, at this point it was transportation and, and, you know, just to note that, you know, these skis for transportation had a free heel for walking, you know, um, obviously, you know, there's, I've seen some of these older skis and kind of even that rock, rock art that I mentioned, these skis appeared to be very long, you know, and if you think about it, longer skis, um, are probably going to give you more flotation. It's going to hold you up on deeper snowpack and, you know, it, it makes more sense. Maybe not, they, they weren't thinking about skis in terms of how we think about skis. Uh, as far as we can tell, and I'm going to kind of get into this transition period of when that started happening, but I just kind of wanted to set the framework for what skis were, what skis were used for, you know, during that time period. So there's some reports that soldiers even started using skis as far back as the middle ages. So now we're kind of, you know, we're kind of working forward from here. And obviously these different societies and groups of people, you know, they were using skis to get uh, from A to B, like I was saying, you know, they're using for hunting, uh, farming. I don't know how you'd farm, but you get the idea, you know, you're using it for things. But then, you know, middle ages come around and there's reports of soldiers using skis. And you think about it. I mean, that makes sense. There's been a long history of soldiers using skis. You know, and obviously this is way back, but if you lived in these countries that had snow, you needed a way to travel. Again, it's just, it's this, it's this way, it's a tool that you're using in order to accomplish these tasks. And that's kind of how the viewpoint was at that, at that time. So by the mid 1700s, uh, the Norwegian military had formed companies of ski troops and the very first skiing competitions were held in the military uh, by 1767. Now, again, we're going kind of broad here, but, you know, ski competition, I'm not actually sure. That'd probably be a, a cool, if any of you know what kind of ski competitions were happening in the military in the 1700s, let me know. I'd love to dig into that a little bit. But, you know, I'm sure it was, uh, you know, competitions and proficiency of somehow, you know, whether it was racing across flat ground or, whatever it may be. But as you'll see, as we kind of 
get into this different realm of what skis were being used for, you know, competitions changed as well. And uh, you probably had a little more diversity in terms of what was happening. But still at, at this point, skis are primarily being used as transportation over the snow. But obviously with, you know, they're competing in some fashion. They're going against each other. Very human nature. <laughs> you know, you, you know, everyone kind of starts doing stuff. And of course you want to see who's the best. You want to innovate. You want to, somebody wanted to be the best and, you know, uh, take the prize home. And I'm sure that drove, you know, competition drives a lot of great things, you know, and, uh, obviously it did in this point. Um, as we roll kind of into the early 1800s, people were starting to use skis for more than just utilitarian purposes. And we see this because by 1843, the first non-military ski competition was announced in Tromso in Northern Norway. So, you know, there's people are getting away from the military application of it and they're starting to compete against each other, you know, just as civilians. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, and how well all of this is documented. I'm, I'm sure there's so much history to be looked at and dug up. Cause if you think about it, I mean, skis were around these people for thousands of years and I'm sure there was all sorts of, you know, it, it wasn't like you had to be in the military to have a pair of skis. I mean, people had skis, obviously we just talked about people using skis for all sorts of things. And I'm sure people use skis you know, around each other. And there was, you know, who knows? I mean, that's the, that's what I could dig up for a non-military ski competition, but who knows if local villages or people are digging into that. I'm sure they were. I feel like I said, I think it's kind of human nature. If you, Hey, we both got the same tool. Let's see who uses it better. That's uh, just something I think we tend to do, but that is worth, you know, noting that now people are starting to organize something to use skis as public and compete p- compete against each other. I'm assuming it was probably more cross country style stuff, honestly. Um, maybe more flat, you know, flatter terrain, and um, maybe what we would think of as kind of like a classic cross country race or something like that. So that gives us a little history of skiing in Norway. And, and just, just to note, like I mentioned, there is a lot of other ski history going on in the world at that point. Um, it was pretty vast. I mean, you've got stuff going on in Russia, Altai Mountains in Asia, Finland. I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of really cool history uh, happening. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, ha- you know, in these snowy areas, I think people were figuring out similar techniques of putting boards on their feet and walking around. And it was necessary because <laughs> when there's a lot of snow, you got to come up with something and, you know, you're just trying to improve your efficiency and get from, from A to B. I'm not going to cover that, but there are the all time out stuff is really interesting. The little I have read up on that, uh, Nils Larson, uh, a real, legendary telemark skier uh i think did even did a documentary on the altai mountains and kind of some of the skis i've seen from that are pretty wild you know they're like you know fully have like hide on the bottom like skins um i don't know if they're permanent but you can tell they're they're made for walking a lot and um it's cool stuff but i don't want to go down too far on that rabbit hole but just you know skis were used as a utilitarian item It, it was a tool in the toolbox that's what was going on. <clears throat> so, so what is telemark? And this is, this is where, you know, I kind of want to get into just like, what is the word telemark? And the name telemark means the mark of the Thelir, the ancient North Germanic tribe that inhabited what is now known as Upper Telemark in the migration period in the Viking age. And I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I knew this. I'm I'm sure I've come across it at some point in my studies, but um, yeah, that, that kind of opens it up too. So 
it's uh you know it's referencing this north germanic tribe in upper telemark well what is telemark then you know that's the word telemark but that's where uh, that's what it means but up until 2020 telemark was its own county in norway and it recently merged with vestfold and is now called vestfold og telemark so Moving forward in the conversation, Telemark, you know, it's a region in Norway. I mean, that's the easiest way to think about it. So, you know, Norway is a big country. It's a very long country. <laughs> if you've ever been there, I mean, I've, I've been to very few parts of it. I've been to the Telemark region, to a couple of the, the towns in Telemark. I've been to Oslo. There's so much more to see there. <laughs> it's going to take me a lifetime of trips trying to go to all the cool places that I've seen over the years. But that's what I want you guys to understand first. What the word, you know, less about what the word means, but understanding like in today, Telemark is a region in Norway. And that's that's the important part of this. Um, now to understand what Telemark skiing is, um, we want to go back to the idea of skiing being kind of this utilitarian thing and used primarily for transportation. Okay. We also want to bring into the picture the town of Morgadal. And Morgadal is a town in the Telemark region that's about 200 kilometers from Oslo. So it's about a three hour drive. Okay. And then next is bringing up an important figure named Sondre Norheim who was born in 1825. Okay, and we're going to talk about him a little bit more here coming up. So let's talk about Telemark as a style, okay? During this period of time where people used skeins as a means of transportation, they also started using it as recreation, okay? And by the 1850s, Morgadal, this town in the Telemark region of Norway, became a hotbed of activity for skiing as a sport. Not just utility, you know, not just as this utility, as this tool, but it was starting to be used as a sport. And this gentleman named Sondre Norheim was one of the key figures that was pushing that forward. And, you know, is, is, nowadays recognized as the father of modern skiing. So I always try to think about this era must have been such a cool thing, you know, and, and Sondre Norheim obviously, you know, really gets kind of pushed out in the forefront of this, but imagine a, imagine a time where everyone's kind of used these, these skis for just walking around and kind of getting, you know, from dwelling to dwelling, village to village, you know, People are proficient. They're competing against each other. And then you have this thing that you've always had, but somebody starts thinking about it in a different way and they start changing it and it becomes sport and it becomes, you know, something that was already part of your lifestyle then gets kind of morphed into not something you're just using every day, but you know, it's, it's becoming something that you're passionate about. And, uh, I, I highly recommend checking out the Sondre Norheim website. It's got some really fun stuff and, you know, without digging too deep into his personality, I will say he comes across to me as, as, uh, maybe what we would consider a modern day ski bum. (laughs) Uh, you know, he's, he's pushing the limits. He's trying to get out of the house and go skiing as much as he can. And it just, it paints a really cool picture of this man that was just incredibly passionate about getting on his skis, making his equipment work for himself better and seeing what he could do to push the limits of where he was skiing and what he was skiing on. And, uh, I just, I always like reading little, it's always fun to go brush up on that because it's a good, you know, not just in scheme, but it's just, it's fun to read about passionate people, 
you know, from different eras too. And I think we all have that kind of fire within us. You know, sometimes it gets kind of buried, but you know, we're all looking for some sort of purpose, right? You know, and we all find it in different places. And, you know, I, I I don't think we've changed a lot. You know, I think, I think we still are (laughs) pushing for that same thing. And when I read about him, I can relate to it on a lot of levels. And so it's cool to think about this, this era, you know, of telemark and, and kind of passion for, for it as more of a sport. But the next thing we want to talk about is telemark as a turn. Okay. This is the key to the entire conversation. Okay. Telemark is a downhill technique on free heel equipment. Okay. So we know telemark's a region in Norway. We know skiing's been used for transportation. And now we are starting to talk about people looking at skiing differently. And they're starting to think about it in terms of a sport and a utility, but they're, you know, they're starting to think about it differently. But this is the key. Telemark is a downhill technique on free heel equipment. Okay. So to be clear, two key points. Telemark is a turn that was developed by the people of the Telemark region on free heel skis. Okay. Point number two, it's a downhill technique on free heel bindings. The description of it really is where you're making a lunging motion by dropping the uphill skis knee and then alternating this motion to go the other direction. So to go right, you will put your left foot forward and drop your right knee. And to go left, you will put your right foot forward and drop your left knee, okay? And you're doing this in succession. Once you're good at it, you're alternating this motion back and forth. And that's what's turning the skis and making it so you can use free heel equipment going downhill. So telemark is a downhill technique that can be done on free heel equipment. So we've just gone from thousands of years of using skis where you're walking around and you need a free heel and you don't need a free heel. I mean, for those of you who have Alpine skied now in modern times, you can shuffle around. <laughs> it's uh, but it's not as efficient. You know what I mean? And so, you know, the, the ability to walk meant that you were, you know, walking on your skis. And at that point, kind of this era that I'm talking about right here, primarily in that situation, you had a, what's called a toe binding. And it was like a little loop that went through the, the, the center of the ski and you put the toe of your boot in there, you know, and you had some sort of a, a boot made out of leather. Not like what we think about leather boots today in modern telemark, but you know, you had a boot and you slid your toe in and you could walk around. And then as these guys are developing it more as a sport going downhill, you can obviously use that toe binding. So one thing I want to note is some other things going on in Morgadol during that time. Okay. We just talked about what a telemark turn looks like, but here's, here's other things that are important to realize ski jumping was going on like the building of jumps and people are jumping on the skis you know they're finding enjoyment in that they're finding enjoyment in catching air (laughs) i mean that's what it is right you know people are it was like a sunday activity in in morgadal you know you go out with your family and you build a jump and uh i mean that's what i would love to see that too i mean can you imagine it's like all right, Sunday's around, you know, day off of work. What are we going to do, kids? Oh, we're going to go build a jump. All right, cool. <laughs> so it just, it just, that, that just seems like so beautiful, you know, like this idea that 
you're going to go challenge yourself. I mean, we're not talking massive jumps, right? Not at first, but obviously people started pushing themselves and you're jumping. And uh, you'll notice that from ski jumping, even in modern times, they still land in a telemark stance. So in the same area, you've got ski jumping going on, on, you know, normal skis that they were using with a toe binding. They're walking in the mountains. They're still using it as a tool to travel, to go look at things, to gather things. And now they're downhill skiing using a telemark turn. Okay. So ski jumping, walking in the mountains, downhill skiing using a telemark turn. Other things to note, some of the innovations that come from Morgadol during that same time period. Shorter skis and also shape to the skis. In other words, adding a little bit of side cut. Side cut in a ski helps you initiate turns. It's easier to initiate a turn with side cut. You know, if you just have a block of wood, it's not, it's not as easy to get on edge. So they're moving from this transportation style of ski, which is much longer and they're going shorter. And if you look at skis, that guys like Sondre Norheim and his friends were using at that time, they're not super, super skinny. Okay. So, so think about that. I said earlier, you know, traveling skis, you're probably using a longer ski to get the flotation. Well, if you shorten the skis, but you make them a little wider, again, wider in the 1850s, not wide, like 130 millimeters under your foot, (laughs) but Wider skis, shorter, and with some shape so they were easier to turn. These are some innovations happening so they could do those other things. Jump, walk, downhill ski. Okay. By 1866, Sondre was invited to participate in what has been described as the world's first ski jumping competition with prizes held in Ofta. Uh, Hoidalsmo, which is 15 kilometers west of Morgadal. There he won first prize and also received an extra award for spectacular performance. This was the first competition where an audience outside Morgadal recognized Sondre's skills as a skier. In 1868, he was in Pressed and surprised the audience and his competitors when he participated in the first national skiing competition in Norway, held in the capital, Christiana, which is now Oslo. And people in Christiana had heard about this extraordinary skier, and Sondre was invited. He, and this is my favorite part, <laughs> he and His two fellow skiers arrived in the capital after a three-day walk on skis from Morgadal, a distance of 200 kilometers. So these poor farmers from Morgadal get invited because of their skill set all the way to Christiana, and they ski all the way there. That's incredible. (laughs) So kind of continuing the story at Iversloken, Sondre demonstrated for the first time outside Telemark, the Telemark turn and the turn. And this is important. And I, I should say the Telemark turn and also the turn, which later from 1901 and on, has been called the Christiana turn. So just to clarify, let me reread that for the first, and I'm going to read it maybe in a different way. For the first time outside Telemark, the Telemark turn, and also the turn which later from 1901 on has been called the Christiana turn, or as we would know it today, the parallel turn. Sondre was using heel bindings 
and he had shorter skis with curved sides. Other participants used the common toe binding. So here's these three guys, highly skilled, not only in turning, but in jumping. They are, they are truly well-rounded telemark skiers, okay? So these guys walk all the way to, to Christiana, to Oslo. They also have heel bindings. So at this point, uh, these birch bindings and and uh, they're they're pretty significant. It's a toe binding with a with a heel that you can slip around the back of your boot. And I've put these bindings on, just to kind of insert a little personal experience here. And I've said this in previous podcasts, but if you haven't heard, these bindings are like modern day bindings in 2021. Okay, legitimately, like where the pivot point is around the toe portion of your boot makes it a very active feel. It has, it, it, it's very, it's not neutral. So these aren't flexing on the toe and that's an important part. I'm not going to go down that road too far with leather boots and three pin bindings, but I will tell you, it's like, it's not anything like that. And so it's very important to notice here. So these guys have heel bindings, shorter skis, curved sides, side cut, like we just talked about. And everybody else is just on these toe bindings. <clears throat> so continuing the story. Skiers from different parts of Norway participated. The 42-year-old Sondre won with brilliance. He was a revelation to everyone present. Newspaper reports said about Sondre. It was the winner of the first prize who excelled over all the other competitors. He had such a remarkable style of skiing that one would think he had been born into it and that it was his natural way of moving around. The performance at Iversloken was a major breakthrough for Sondre and the new style of skiing. People were overwhelmed by this middle-aged man the poor cotter from the countryside demonstrating for everyone what an innovative ski artist he was representing something totally new. First off, I love that he was 42 and crushing the competition. So let me just throw that in there. <laughs> so if anybody's making excuses out there about not being able to ski good anymore, you, you, there's no excuses. Sondre was killing it back in the 1800s at the, at the ripe age of 42 in a jumping competition, no less, and a skiing competition. So from that point on, the style of turning that Sondre showed was referred to as telemark skiing, okay? So more or less, that's the answer right there. What is telemark skiing? It is the the turn that was demonstrated by the people of the region of Telemark. Okay. And from that day on, everybody referred to that technique as Telemark skiing. So now to answer the age old question, maybe in, with a little more detail, what is Telemark skiing then today? Well, it's, it's really the same as it's always been. A Telemark skier is someone who uses free heel equipment to one, make telemark style turns. Two, make parallel style turns. Three, jumps. Four, walks in the mountains. Those four things really, that is, that is, that is a telemark skier in the mid 1800s. And frankly, that's a telemark skier in 2021. So it really hasn't changed, you know? Now you'll hear me bagging on the old P turn. The uh maybe I'll start calling them Christiana turns. <laughs> uh but it's it, it's uh look, I, I think the reason most of us most of us all know how to make a parallel turn on telemark equipment, that makes you a good skier. You have good technique. But I think going back to the idea of style. That is why once you know the telemark 
style, the telemark technique, we tend to stick to doing a telemark turn. So, but I wanted to I wanted to add that in there because really, what Sondre demonstrated in the 1860s, both at the competition and at home and just skiing with his buddies, these are the things that still ring true today. And, uh, but what will oh, you know, like I said, always will be the focus of having the ability to do all these things is style. And when I talk about protecting the turn and carrying forward into the future, this is all about style and nothing to do with the gear you're on. Okay. All of the things I mentioned, um, above have nothing to do or, you know, all the things I mentioned before have nothing to do with what gear you have on, but it literally has everything to do with your technique and style that you're using. So it's important as we move forward into the future that we remember telemark really, well, like what telemark really means and where it came from. Okay. New gear, it'll help us in our search to accomplish bigger feats, you know, go bigger off cliffs or ski faster or ski bumps better or whatever. But guess what? It will never overshadow the importance and and understanding and practicing the techniques and, and how you execute them, okay? Gear innovations there, I mean... Obviously, you know, Sondre himself, I mean, these guys in Telemark are using, they're taking something and improving upon it, you know, and they added a heel binding so they could jump and make stronger turns. They shortened the skis and gave side cut to the skis so they could turn better. You know, there's nothing wrong with improving upon the gear, but Unfortunately, people get caught up in the gear in terms of like, that's, you know, you've got to have this gear to do telemark. The reality of it is, is this is, this is why like when people want to define what telemark is, you know, and you know, the, the internet is like this incredible echo chamber for this question. And part of why I wanted to do the, do the podcast because people sit around and Somebody, you know, you'll see someone put a post on the internet and then someone is very quick to say, that's not telemark skiing, you know, or, Hey, I just got my new NTN gear and the crusty old guy with leather boots says, that's not telemark skiing. The, what is telemark skiing has literally nothing to do with equipment. And it has everything to do with the style of turn that you're making. And I would argue that also being a complete telemark skier encompasses all of these things. Knowing how to walk in the mountains. Knowing how to walk on flatland. Knowing how to walk up a skin track. You know, knowing how to travel on your skis. Okay knowing how to make a telemark turn, knowing how to make a parallel turn. And honestly, I've always said this. Anybody who knows me knows that I think jumping is a, is it, is a part of being a telemark skier too. Now, am I saying all of you need to know how to jump? No, but I think it makes you a more complete skier, you know, but the equipment, the equipment does not make the skier. And the equipment definitely does not make a telemark skier. The technique is telemark. And it's done on free hill equipment. And it's an important turn. And it's been around for a really, really long time. And I think that's what's important. So the only other thing I was going to say is I, I've, I've talked about this in a couple of my podcasts, you know, my stance, a lot of people think, and, and maybe this is something to touch on, is telemark over the years, you'll meet people, especially in, in, in the United States, and you'll say, I'm a telemark skier. And they say immediately, 
uh, oh, that's that's cool. You like hiking uphill. <laughs> and I'm always like, no, actually, it's a downhill technique. And they're kind of surprised. Like, oh, I thought telemark meant going uphill, you know? And, you know, so what you can see from today, telemark one, it's called telemark the telemark style because it comes from the telemark region that's where the name comes from but you can do all of these things but really the the technique the way you turn going downhill is usually what we look at and i think those other uh peripheral things are are they're fortifying you as a great telemark skier so you can move in the mountains you know how to make different styles of turns and uh you know jumping's the bonus So, but the one thing I wanted to touch on with that, because people think telemark represents uphill travel, oftentimes people have the misconception that the AT style now, like where you can hike up in a rigid boot and lock your heel down to then make Christiana turns. (laughs) Um, it's telemark did not evolve into that. That's an incredibly important, important part to point out in this telemark did not evolve into Alpine. Okay. And I understand people want to be like, well, that's the old and this is the new. And it obviously evolved from one thing into the other. And they, they really want to convince themselves that, you know, one technique became another. I'm not of that mindset. If you think that way, that's totally fine. And I, I think that's great. If you, if you would love to look at the evolution of a drop knee skier slowly dragging his knuckles on the ground and then the evolutionary plane of it is him standing tall in a parallel turn Hey, more power to you. But I've always been of the mindset that Telemark is on one evolutionary plane and Alpine skiing uh, our Christiana term brethren and sisters are on another plane, you know, and, uh, you know, we're stoked for them and they're hopefully stoked for us. Although I question that sometimes. <laughs> I think they, I think they think we're living in the dark ages. But with that said, hopefully that's a good explanation of what telemark skiing is, what where telemark skiing came from, and what we can strive to do as a modern day telemark skier. We have fantastic equipment. We have all of it at freehilllife.com. <laughs> and you can pick it up there. But here's the thing. Uh, we have fantastic equipment in 2021 and it's great and it's easy to easier to learn on there's still going to be some pay in to become a great telemark skier but you're going to learn all these things that come along with that and to be a complete telemark skier all the things these guys did in the 1860s we still learn today and they just make us better telemark skiers so I hope you enjoyed this little breakdown of what is Telemark skiing today. I really appreciate you listening and hopefully you enjoyed a little history. And like I said, a couple of the references I used, I'll put them in the podcast note notes, highly recommend picking up uh, the Sondre Norheim book. It's got some great stuff in it. And I'd love to hear what you think about the episode. You know, what do you think Telemark skiing is? Did I miss anything? Is there anything I could add to that history? Uh, Let me know. I'm always, always trying to learn more, pick up more about where Telemark skiing has come from, and maybe that'll help us to know where it's going in the future. But with that said, how you can support us, uh, like I said, shopping at freehealllife.com. We have all the equipment to get you into Telemark skiing. We've got new gear. We've got used gear. We can put packages together. We got parts to fix your stuff. We've got a service shop. 
We've got our service and demo beta test shops that we're putting up, Washburn, Wisconsin, Front Range of Colorado, and we'll be announcing the third one here pretty soon. Uh, if you want to support the podcast directly and you're digging the episodes, you can always make an additional donation of your choice. PayPal.me slash Free Heal Life. Articles, all that good stuff. Telemarkskier.com. YouTube channel uh, is going off. We're putting new tech videos up. We're putting Stoke videos up. We got Alpine heel, heel removal tips. We got all sorts of fun stuff. Put a new vlog up last week. And uh, we hope you guys are enjoying that. We're getting a lot of, a lot more people scoping that out and we're psyched. Same with our Instagram accounts. You can find us on there. And you can always email me direct. Like I said, if I miss something or maybe you have a question, you can always send those to podcast at freehealllife.com. I'm always happy to answer questions. Like I said last week in the mailbag, I got a little behind. Tried to answer some of those in bulk on the last episode, mailbag episode. But I love hearing from you guys. It's amazing. So let's keep protecting the turn. You know, uh, I hope this helped you understand a little bit about my perspective on this and try to give some historical context so it's not just me making stuff up and telling you how it is, but you know, using a, a historical perspective to try to look at where we're at now. And uh, hopefully that's the challenge we can take out of this. All become better telemark skiers focus on our style, our, our own telemark style and uh, sharing that with others. So my brothers and sisters and protectors of the turn until next week, thanks for listening and spread telemark always my friends. Peace.